governors and White House officials, but he will be joining us shortly. Today, I'll start with an update of our progress with the vaccination program and provide details with some of the upcoming vaccine clinics. Commissioner Pichek will present our weekly modeling, followed by Commissioner Squirrel, who will give a mental health update. And then Dr. Levine will give us a health update before the governor joins us with the latest from the White House briefing. First, I want to congratulate all Vermonters. We are now first in the nation for vaccines administered per 100,000 people. This is quite an accomplishment, but we still have more work to do. If you haven't done so already, please make an appointment to be vaccinated. Your participation is critical for us to reach the next milestones in the Vermont Forward Plan. You can sign up online at healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine, or you can call 855-722-7878 to make an appointment. As I mentioned on Friday, we are transitioning our vaccination program to not only provide the mass vaccination sites that you have grown accustomed to, but also to provide more opportunities for walk-ins and pop-up clinics at venues such as colleges, work sites, fairgrounds, and speedways. In the future, we are also considering areas where people uh, may assemble for other activities. This is done in an attempt to get as many people vaccinated as possible by making it easy and convenient. As an update, we are offering numerous opportunities to be vaccinated this week, including today at Middlebury College and Bennington College, May 6th at St. Michael's College, May 7th at Northern Vermont University in Linden, May 8th at Castleton University and Northern University in Johnson on May 11th. These clinics are open to all eligible Vermonters and there are some walk-in uh, walk opportunities available at all of these clinics as well. We are also hosting vaccine clinics at the Tunbridge Fairgrounds this Friday, May 7th. And again, uh, registration is preferred, but we also will take a few walk-ins at those facilities. And we are finalizing plans to partner with the state of New Hampshire at the Lancaster, New Hampshire Fairgrounds on Friday, May 21st. Turning to racetracks, Bear Ridge Speedway in Bradford is hosting a clinic on Saturday, May 8th from 4 to 7 p.m. And we have a May 8th clinic planned at Devil's Bowl Speedway, although this time has not yet been established. We are also looking at an event at Thunder Road. I'll announce the details of those events as we finalize them. Please note the speedways are walk-ins only. You don't have to register. You just need to show up and you will be vaccinated. Our EMS partners in uh, Newport slash Glover and Calix will conduct an Essex County barnstorming event hosting clinics offering Johnson & Johnson vaccine on May 8th and 9th. There are nine locations scheduled and here are the details. On Saturday, May 8th, the Concord School from 8 to 10 a.m. Lunaberg Common from 11 to 1 p.m., Maidstone Town Office from 2 to 4 p.m., and on Sunday, May 9th, at the East Haven Community Building from 8 to 10 a.m., the Island Pond Fire Station from 8 to 10 a.m., the Newark uh, Street School from 11 uh, a.m. to 1 p.m., the Norton Miriam Nelson Municipal Building from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m., the Broomfield Silvio Conte Forest parking lot from 1 to 3 p.m. and the Canaan High School from 4.30 to 7 p.m. Although again, we encourage registration. Some walk-ins are available at each of these sites. In addition to the clinics I just announced, there are many other clinics with available appointments throughout the state. You can sign up online at healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine or you can call 855-722-7878 to make an appointment. You can also make an appointment directly with CVS, Walgreens, 
or Kenny drugs. We have been successful getting shots in arms, and up to this point, we have been using all of our weekly allocation from the federal government. I want to thank Vermonters for doing their part to get vaccinated. In terms of overall progress, as of this morning, 351,300 people have been vaccinated against COVID-19. Uh, there's 104,000 have received their first dose and 247,300 have received their first and last dose. In closing, last night I saw a news story on WCAX about an assisted living facility in Woodstock where a mother and daughter had the opportunity to hug each other again for the first time in a year. And that's because they were both vaccinated. Ironically, I happen to know the mother and the daughter uh, from my days growing up in the area. But it struck me that this is just one of the many reasons to get vaccinated, so that we can visit our loved ones once again. Knowing how difficult it was to restrict vi visitation in long-term care facilities, this story, and perhaps many others like them, compels me to again request, if you haven't been vaccinated, please make an appointment. There are many more hugs to give as we return to life as it would, once was. At this time, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Pichek for a weekly update. Thank you, Secretary Smith, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, we continue to see improving COVID-19 trends across the country, across the region, and here in Vermont as well, with the vaccines really beginning to demonstrate their power to end this awful pandemic if we continue to step up and get vaccinated. This week, Vermont is reporting 537 COVID-19 cases, a slight bump up in cases compared to last week, However, our seven-day average remains stable, decreasing very slightly, and cases reported over the past two weeks are the lowest totals that we've seen in nearly six months. Further, Vermont continues to lead the country in per capita testing, both over the last seven days and the last 30 days, so we can be confident that we are continuing to find a significant number of COVID-19 cases that are present in our state. Additionally, when we take a closer look at the cases by age, we see that cases among those 40 and over actually decreased 22% this week, while cases among those under 40 increased 23%. And again, we can explain this by taking a look at the vaccination rates. 78% of Vermonters 40 and over have started or completed vaccination but only 41% of Vermonters under 40 have done the same. Now, these age groups did become uh, eligible more recently, but they are not scheduling to the degree that we would like them to, which is particularly true for the 18 to 29 year old category. In fact, when you compare vaccination uptake by age in Vermont against the US average, you will see that Vermont is far ahead, or in some cases, pretty far ahead, uh, in each age category, except for the 18 to 29 year olds, where we are actually slightly below the national average. And with Mother's Day coming up this Sunday, there is certainly no better gift that you can give your mom than by taking care of yourself, your friends, and your family by getting vaccinated as soon as possible. Cases were generally stable in counties across Vermont, we did, however, see improvement in Chittenden County and in Orleans County, and again, generally saw improvement in the Northeast Kingdom. However, Essex County did see a jump in cases this week, and this was something that we were concerned about last week, considering the high case rates in Coas County in New Hampshire and the counties in Western Maine as well. It does appear that those counties in New Hampshire and Maine have seen some improvement this week, but again, we want to provide an extra word of caution to those living in the area to make sure that you are getting tested regularly and most importantly, getting vaccinated. Taking a look at the forecast we presented last week, you can see that we are generally following that trend over the past seven days. And this lower case trajectory is something that we anticipate seeing through the month of May and into June. 
Further, the CDC ensemble model, which takes a number of different models from across the country, also anticipates cases falling in Vermont over the next four weeks. And again, to ensure these trends continue and we're able to put this pandemic behind us in less than two months, we urge those who have not yet stepped up to get vaccinated to do so as soon as possible. As we were expecting, Vermont's hospitalization rate is starting to see a steadier decrease this week with overall hospitalizations down close to 13% and uh, down 19% over the last 14 days. Over the last seven days, Vermont has had the fewest number of current hospitalizations on a per capita basis in the United States. This decline is largely being driven by fewer people over the age of 60 requiring hospitalization. In fact, from March to April, the rate of hospitalization decreased 36% for those 60 to 69, and decreased 60% for those over 70 years old. Further, with vaccination rates continuing to increase and case rates continuing to decrease in the population 40 and older, we expect to see hospitalization rates to continue their decline through the next few weeks. The improved case and hospitalization trends have continued to favorably impact our fatality rates here in Vermont as well. We did unfortunately report 17 deaths in the uh, month of April, but that was a decrease from the 24 we reported in March and the 71 that we reported in January. Further, our May fatality projection remains unchanged and we anticipate seeing a further decrease in deaths in the month of May, with fatalities in May projected to be as few as five and as many as 15 for the month. Turning to our general vaccination progress, as Secretary Smith mentioned, Vermont continues to be a leader, standing at number one on doses administered per 100,000 and standing third in the country on the percent of our population with at least one dose and the percent of our population that is fully vaccinated. And again, when it comes to our elderly Vermonters, our older Vermonters, 65 and older, 95.5% uh, of them have received at least a single dose and 85.2% of them are now fully vaccinated, making us again number one in the country. And even though we want to see stronger uptake from those 18 to 29, and some other states around us and across the country are seeing a declining interest in vaccinations, you can see on the next chart that Vermont continues to have a steady trend. And you can see over the last couple of days how we started to stand out from the rest of the country, and particularly some of the states that were closest to us. Looking at the next slide, you can also see that the demand for those that have not yet started vaccination is the highest in Vermont compared to any other state. So we continue to have a really strong uptake in terms of those who are starting vaccination when compared to the states around us or the states uh, across the country. So again, that really speaks well to the vaccination program today and what we expect to see over the next few weeks. Looking at the Vermont Forward Plan, you can see that today we stand at 57.4% of people in Vermont that have started or uh, completed vaccination. Uh, that is per the CDC. Uh, if we were to use the 2020 numbers, it would be a little lower, the 2020 census numbers. Uh, but in any event, uh, we anticipate that over the next two to three weeks uh, that we will meet our next goal in the Vermont Forward Plan that is assuming that we have demand that is consistent with what we've experienced over the past few weeks. But again, the only way that that will become a reality is if those who are not yet vaccinated step up to do so. COVID-19 trends across the region continue to be another bright spot. This week, we are reporting 47,000 cases across the region, the fewest cases that we've seen since November 2nd. This represents 12,000 fewer cases than last week a decrease of over 20%. We also saw a decrease this week of 14% in terms of hospitalizations around the region and deaths fell as well. Looking ahead, the new regional forecast projects decreasing case trends in each jurisdiction neighboring Vermont over the next six weeks, decreasing to levels that we have not seen since last summer, painting a very optimistic picture for the Northeast and for Vermont in the weeks to come. And at this time, I would like to turn it over to Commissioner Sarah Squirrel. Thank you, Commissioner Piacek. Good morning, everyone. 
Thank you all for listening in today. It's timely that I can speak with you all today because this month is Mental Health Awareness Month and this week is Children's Mental Health Awareness Week. We know the impact of COVID-19 has had on all of us, especially on our children and youth who have experienced incredible change, chaos, crisis, and uncertainty. We also know that even prior to COVID, many of our children and youth were struggling. Our pivot as a state to remote and hybrid learning did leave many of our Vermont children and youth lacking the benefits of access to school, the social interaction, the personal connection, the safety and structure and routine. We must also remember that remote learning does disproportionately impact our most vulnerable children and youth, those with disabilities, special health needs, mental health needs, and those living in poverty. In March, I shared data from the PACE Vermont study, a collaboration between the University of Vermont and the Vermont Department of Health. This study highlighted that youth ages 12 to 17 reported significantly more depressive symptoms and elevated anxiety in the fall of 2020 as compared to the fall of 2019. The next wave of data for the winter 2020 study indicates that this trend continues to move in the wrong direction. Teens continue to report increased depressive symptoms, even over what was reported in the fall of 2020, and continued elevated increases in anxiety. In addition, in April, we saw an alarming surge in youth presenting in emergency departments for mental health needs. Fortunately, these numbers have decreased recently, but continue to warrant our attention. The data is clear that COVID-19 has and continues to have a significant impact on the mental health of our youngest Vermonters. Our school systems are a critical point of both access to services and supports, as well as assessment of need. In calendar year 2020, almost 50% of children and youth on Medicaid access their mental health services in a school setting. Fundamentally, our efforts to fully reopen schools have been critical and I want to commend the efforts of our education leaders, teachers, and support staff in working to achieve this. We also know that now more than ever, the fundamental building blocks of social and emotional competency are critical to our children and youth's overall health and well-being. This is why social emotional functioning, mental health and well-being are one of the three legs of the Department of Education's recovery plan and identified as one of the core underpinnings necessary for students' optimal growth and success. The Agency of Education's recovery plan clearly lays out that as our children and youth return to school, we need to attend to their social emotional well-being, structure, and reestablishing strong and secure relationships. The more that schools can focus and invest in promoting mental health and equipping children with social and emotional skills, the fewer children and youth will develop more serious problems down the road. It is also important to note that schools and educators should know that they are not alone in this. Addressing the social, emotional, and mental health needs of children and youth can only be done through collective action and partnership between our education, health, and mental health systems. The good news is that Vermont is poised to meet those needs and leverage the assets and strengths that we have. Vermont achieved the number one ranking in mental health access in the nation earlier this year. And a lot of this ranking is based on incredible healthcare coverage for children and access to special education services. We also have one of the best and most revered school-based mental health systems in the country that we refer to as Success Beyond Six, a partnership between our education and mental health systems that we should all be proud of. Success Beyond Six reduces cost to education by leveraging Medicaid and has built and solidified an incredible partnership between our local community mental health agencies and our education partners, with Success Beyond Six services in over 90% of our supervisory unions. I worked for a community mental health agency and ran a school-based mental health program for over a decade in Northern Vermont. So I've experienced firsthand how powerful this collaboration can be. I can remember my work in rural Vermont. There was a family in town that we were particularly worried about, likely substance use, mental health issues in the home, and young children. 
On the first day of school that year, we became aware of one of the youngest children in the family, a three and a half year old. That three and a half year old got himself on the bus and arrived at his first day of school wearing nothing but a diaper and carrying an empty lunchbox. Now that is resilience. The principal of the elementary school and I worked side by side to support him and his family. I am happy to say they have graduated from high school and are working in their community. As mental health and education partners, we will continue to work together to address the social, emotional, and mental health needs of students, and as schools fully reopen to ensure that all children have the opportunity to thrive and to meet their full potential. We can also take this opportunity to fully realize the opportunities that summer camps will offer. And I would encourage parents and caregivers to go to the Summer Matters page on the Vermont After School website, vermontafterschool.org slash summer matters. Summer 2021 will be an important time for Vermont's youth to re-engage in recreational interests, activities, reconnect with their friends, and rebuild that sense of optimism and sense of connection to their communities. Again, I want to commend our education system for their efforts to tackle the complexity of reopening schools. And the issue of supporting child and youth mental health is not one to be addressed in isolation, but together. We should also keep in mind that children and youth are resilient. They have great capacity to adapt and change if we provide the right supports around them. We have a lot of work to do, but I have confidence that we can do this, that we can support our youngest Vermonters to ensure their social, emotional, and mental health needs are met, and they can thrive as we of the state continue to move towards recovery. We can do this because we have some of the best conditions in the country, the strongest partnerships, and the moral imperative to inspire us to work together. If there is one thing I have learned in my work is that when our communities the state, mental health, and education partners align towards a common goal, there is nothing we cannot accomplish. I also want to acknowledge that as we move towards full recovery as a state, these are still hard times for many Vermonters. And if you or someone you know is struggling, don't be afraid to ask for help, and don't be afraid to talk about it. Vermonters have a broad range of free 24-7 confidential mental health supports available to them you can still call Vermont 211 to access counselors for support or referrals to services. If you or someone you know needs immediate support, you can access the crisis text line. Simply text the letters VT to 741741. And if you or someone you care about is struggling with thoughts of suicide, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-8255. Thank you for the time this morning, and I'm going to turn it over to Commissioner Levine. <clears throat> Thank you, Commissioner Squirrel. And uh, most of you are aware that the commissioner will be leaving office at the end of the month. We wish her the best in her future career. and. As the leader of the uh, other public health portion of the Agency of Human Services, we appreciate her collaboration and leadership and expertise. Regarding my comments, cases continue on a positive trajectory with daily reported cases running as low as 34 on Monday and only one day over 100 in the last two weeks. Positivity rate remains 1.1%. Hospitalizations continue to trend lower, with 17 reported today, six in the ICU. The seven-day case rate for Vermont is 88 per 100,000, compared to the national average of 101.6 per 100,000. While I'm always glad to report declining numbers, I do want to thank everyone who has been getting vaccinated because this has made a huge difference. At the same time, it's important that Vermonters, especially anyone not yet vaccinated, not let up on prevention, avoiding crowds, wearing a mask, keeping a distance, and getting tested are still critical to ending this pandemic. Variants of the virus 
do remain a significant factor in the spread that is still occurring, and we need to keep a close eye on them as we move toward the end of the pandemic. But keep in mind, if the variants were not uh, able to be managed with vaccine, they would be seen at increasing rates as we speak. But let's not forget, we are still in a pandemic. Now, maybe we're all so used to hearing this that the word has lost some of its impact. But just look at how the virus is currently devastating India right now, after first waning there, and remember what COVID has done already here in the United States. We are very fortunate to have some power over this virus, a way to slow it down and even stop it. And that is through vaccination, of course. But we need to use that power to its full potential. Partway just won't cut it. So anyone who has not yet gotten a vaccine, especially younger Vermonters who waited patiently as we first protected those who were older and higher risk, I want you to know it is your turn now. Your shot is waiting for you. You can join the more than 350,000 Vermonters who have gotten at least one dose. That's more than half of the state's entire population. For many of you who have not yet taken the time to get vaccinated, I know you're not in the group that will never take any vaccine. Quite the contrary. You may just be waiting to see. But my question for you now is, how long are you going to wait? We're going on a year's worth of real-time data and study data that tells us this vaccine has been remarkably effective and safe. Look at our own experience here in Vermont. We almost never see a case in anyone over 65 these days. Death rates have plummeted, especially in those over 65. And when a death occurs, it is almost invariably in an unvaccinated person. And we're not hearing about delayed or unanticipated side effects of vaccine months after inoculation. Instead, we are hearing stories of people who got the COVID-19 virus and are having prolonged symptoms or even long haul syndrome who had not gotten vaccinated. The vaccines have now been available here since December, late December at that. They've been studied in thousands of people, been proven to be safe and effective at preventing severe illness and hospitalization. And now with months of real world results to study, we see they mirror what was seen in the original studies. The vaccine is clearly making a difference in slowing the spread of the virus. It is okay to have questions, but please don't leave yourself vulnerable to the virus and don't assume others will protect you. It's just too risky. I've talked here before about how even if you're already vaccinated, you still have a role to play. You can help others along their path to vaccination, whether finding a personal reason to get vaccinated or literally by giving them a ride to a clinic. So if you haven't yet, I ask you now to reach out to someone in your life, especially if they are younger, who may not be vaccinated, whether you're a parent or a grandparent, aunt or uncle or friend. Maybe the registration system feels daunting, or they just don't want to pick up the phone. Maybe they think there is no clinic close enough to them, or they just haven't found that much time in their day. Or maybe a final exam is standing in the way. Or like I see in my days as a doctor, maybe the idea of a shot just makes them feel a little bit nervous. No matter what, there's an option available for everyone because Vermonters have already told us they're willing to get vaccinated. And Vermont standing as a leader in getting people vaccinated proves this to be true. We just need to help get those who are currently unvaccinated to the finish line faster. So share your experience and see what you might be able to do to help. Your influence likely means more than you really know. In the meantime, as you've been hearing, this team will keep doing everything we can to make it as easy as possible, from clinics at college campuses and in communities, to walk-ins or drive-throughs, 
to even some of the more interesting locations you heard the Secretary discuss. With the right information from the right person and the right reason, they will do it. But we need to do this together 100%. With this changing virus, doing it part way just isn't enough. The vaccine's available to all. Now is your time and your turn. Since the governor isn't here just yet, I have a few other comments I'd like to make because in the last several days, virtually every epidemiologist and a number of public health leaders like Dr. Fauci have been weighing in on the issue of community immunity, also called herd immunity. Some have mentioned that 30% or so of the U.S. population indicate they have yet to be vaccinated. Asserting that no matter what percentage they give to achieving herd immunity, they don't think we'll get there. They say we've already taken care of those who are most vulnerable, especially to severe illness, and there will be less hospitalizations and deaths. COVID will just become a disease that younger and healthier people get, and maybe that's okay. But that's not where I stand. Not in this state where we have a tradition of promoting and preserving good health. We need to appeal to Vermonters with more than talk about herd immunity and make it real. Vaccination means protecting vulnerable relatives, visiting with family and friends, sending kids back to school and adults back to the workplace, and continuing to make Vermont be the safest state to live. You saw the data and the diverging curves showing Vermont's vaccination rate continuing on nicely and the rest of the country tailing off significantly. It turns out there's only eight states that have a curve that resembles anything close to Vermont's and only one other in the Northeast, which is New York State. So to those who have yet to be vaccinated, I say, what about the outcomes for young people when and if there are enough cases in young people. The hospitalizations, the long haul COVID, the disruptions to life due to acute illness. And if there's enough spread and transmission, what about the impact of new variant strains and breakthrough infections? Simply put, we can do better. Vermont can do better. We know how to do it and are fortunate to have the vaccine and the know-how. We'll now uh, go into the question and answer period. Yep, he should be down in the next minute or two, so we'll start with Calvin, and if you have another one for the governor when he arrives, we can come back to you. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I guess Dr. Levine, I, um, oh, oh wait, Calvin. away. timing, I guess. Well, good morning, everyone. I uh, just got off the phone with fellow governors, uh, Dr. Fauci, the CDC director, Dr. Walensky, White House officials and others. Um, here's what we heard. Our Pfizer and Moderna will remain uh, relatively steady over the next few weeks, as will the Johnson Johnson allocation. So while we don't expect an increase next week, it will be steady at our current allocation rate. But there is some, uh, some good news. Uh, they're making some changes uh, to the ordering process, which uh, will, would entail creating a federal pool, which may allow us to order above our maximum allocation if there are doses that don't get ordered by other states, which we believe will be the case. Previously, we couldn't order more than our maximum. So if we can keep up demand in Vermont, this could be extremely beneficial uh, to us. So that's about it from the call. So next, as we mentioned on Friday, uh, this past Saturday was Green Up Day. And I wanna thank all those who were out there cleaning up the roadways across the state. Uh, Diana and I spent a few hours greening up on Saturday and we saw quite a few people out there as well. Uh, the biggest find for me uh, this year uh, was, uh, was this. I found uh, an iPhone uh, by the side of I-89 near Exit 7 near Burrow and Pond. 
and this is southbound. I plugged it in afterwards and it took a charge. So uh, if you think it might be yours, just call the office and we'll give it back to you. Uh, next, as you saw in Commissioner Pichuk's presentation, uh, Vermont continues to be a national leader on vaccinations, ranking first in the nation on rate of administration. And well over 60% of adults have had at least one shot, but we can't let up now. Putting this pandemic behind us means we need as many Vermonters as possible to be vaccinated. We've seen incredibly high numbers for those over 65, with almost 95% of them receiving at least one dose. But we still have some work to do with our younger populations. As of right now, only about half of those 30, uh, under 30, have either been vaccinated or scheduled their first dose. So even though we hit our May 1st target, which helped us move into step two of the Vermont Forward Plan, we need to increase our numbers over the next few weeks to make sure we hit our June 1st goal of over 70% of those eligible being vaccinated. That last step uh, is critical uh, because if we hit that mark by July, enough Vermonters will be fully vaccinated so we can drop mandates and restrictions and get back to more normal times, which I know we're all looking forward to and we all want. So if you want to attend concerts, fairs, and festivals, if you want restaurants and bars to stay open past 10 o'clock, do your part and get vaccinated. This truly is a moment of service. On Friday, I talked a little bit about my dad and the greatest generation who sacrificed so much for all of us. When their nation called them to serve, people like my father answered. As some of you have heard me talk about before, shortly after D-Day, my dad was on his way to liberate St. Lo, France, when his tank hit a landmine, losing both his legs. He spent two years recovering at Walter Reed Hospital, but he thought he was one of the lucky ones because many of his fellow soldiers never made it home. They answered their country's call. They stepped up, not for themselves, but for the greater good, and helped secure the freedoms we hold so dear. Now, your state, your country, are asking you to step up. And this ask is much less than what many before us have been asked to do. We just want you to get vaccinated. By doing so, you'll not only help yourself, but the people around you the businesses in your community, your friends, your parents, your kids, your, even your grandparents who might have served themselves. Together, we've shown the way during this once in a century challenge and all Vermonters should be proud of what we've accomplished. But we're in the last few laps of this race and now isn't the time to let up. Now is the time to focus and finish this off with a win. Getting a vaccine is easier now than it's ever been, and there are plenty of appointments. So I'll leave you with one more thought and one more reason to get vaccinated. If you're wondering what to get your mom for Mother's Day, which by the way is this weekend, send her a picture of you getting your shot. I bet that will mean a great deal to her. So with that, We'll go back to questions. And we'll go right back to Calvin. Uh, thanks, Governor. So either for you or for Dr. Levine, so of course we're, we're hearing that potentially next week, um, kids 12 to 15 may be eligible for the, um, the Pfizer shot. So, you know, should that go through, I guess, what, what are you expecting the uptake to, to be? And I guess how, how confident are you that, that parents are going to sign their kids up for the shot? Yeah, I'll let Dr. Levine answer that, but we did talk about that a little bit on the call with the White House. And uh, uh, as you said, uh, we're looking forward to that emergency authorization. authorization. Uh, I believe there will be um, a good number of people who will sign up, but uh, Dr. Levine might be able to answer that better than me. We're thinking there's in the 25 to 27,000 number of teenagers in those age ranges. And um, if their vaccination expectation matches that of their parents, 
and the curve in Vermont, uh, we think there'll be very strong uptake in that group. We also think that uh, the timing will probably be sometime next week. Everyone's got a different date, but their thought is that the advisory group will have made their decision within a day or so. The uh, decisions from FDA and CDC will occur, um, and we'll be prepared for that. Uh, should coincide pretty nicely with uh, the way our vaccine effort is coming out. We have a lot of the pediatric community already engaged, working with uh, communities and uh, families and uh, having them understand the value of the vaccine as well. It's sort of a prelude to getting the vaccine. And I think my second question is probably for Commissioner Squirrel. Um, so I understand that um, the administration and lawmakers, you guys are working on a plan to um, relieve the, the backlog of, of youth that we're seeing in emergency rooms that are waiting sometimes for days on end for uh, acute mental health care. Um, I guess I'm just wondering, what, what does that plan look like in the interim, short term, medium, long term? And then I guess how, how much do you expect uh, this to cost and maybe is it going to be paid for by, by federal funds, or uh, what, what sort of avenues do we have there? Yeah, thanks for the question, Calvin. I really appreciate it. First, I just want to note that this is not necessarily a new issue, um, but one that has certainly been exacerbated by the pandemic. Having children and youth waiting for extended periods of time in emergency departments is unacceptable. Um, it is a systemic issue that requires a systemic response, which is why this morning the Agency of Human Services presented our actions and strategies, immediate, short-term, mid-term, and long-term solutions to address this issue. Second, I think we have to keep in mind um, that long wait times in emergency departments, whether it's children, youth, or adults, are symptomatic of a broader issue in the system, which is flow. Um, so when we start to see backups in emergency departments, it usually means that there's a backlog somewhere else. Um, for example, we did see an uptick in youth presenting in emergency departments in April. I'm happy to report that that is trending down as of today. Uh, one of the primary issues that was contributing to that was lack of step-down options for those children and youth who were in the Brattleboro Retreat at that time, um, thus indicating that some of our solutions need to be on residential capacity, step-down capacity. And those are some of the solutions um, the Department for Children and Families put forward today. In addition to that, um, we can't ignore the fact that the pandemic has continued to have an impact on our system of care. Um, services not being provided fully in person, decreased capacity in our hospital diversion programs, decreased capacity in our residential programs, as I noted. Uh, we have already worked immediately with the Vermont Department of Health to adjust some of the guidance, um, thus allowing community mental health partners and agencies to provide more in-person services and supports in the community, um, as well as lifting some of the restriction on our hospital diversion programs and residential programs, thus increasing capacity, thus increasing access to care, thus creating that flow in the system that we would like to see. From a resource standpoint, we're in a great position as a state right now. Uh, we have put forward recommendations supported by the administration and the governor to implement mobile response. Mobile response is a direct antidote to this problem. It will allow us to work more proactively in communities providing crisis services to children, youth, and families in their homes. Uh, we are looking forward to piloting this um, as a demonstration site in Rutland, along with looking at other opportunities within the state. We are also well positioned um, to deploy and invest many of the additional federal funds that are coming into the Department of Mental Health in a targeted way to address these needs. Uh, we presented some of those options to the legislature this morning, and that will all be done in collaboration with our community mental health partners and with our hospital partners as well. And I guess just to follow up, I mean, do you have a specific, you know, dollar amount potentially of, of how much this might, um, you know, you'd like to see of our American Rescue Plan funds taken to this? And also, I guess, when you look at the, uh, the need, I guess, for investments in beds and, and facilities, I mean, what, what does that look like, you know, physically? And, you know, what kind of concrete steps does uh, will that look like? Well, the good news is we've already made strong investments in our community mental health and system of care. Uh, for example, 71% of the Department of Mental Health's budget goes to community mental health agencies and resources. Uh, we have always demonstrated our commitment to support our community mental health agencies. 
um, the provision of almost $19.7 million in CRF funds to our community mental health agencies. And as we move forward, uh, we look at what we have proposed in the FY22 budget. In addition, we have over $8 million in additional federal funding coming into the Department of Mental Health. There are many needs in the system. We will certainly be prioritizing the targeted investments of many of those flexible resources as we move forward in some of these ideas and solutions to expand capacity. Steve Longchamp, Local 22, Local 44. Uh, with that, uh, again, going back to the 12 to, uh, to 16 year olds, uh, that if it occurs, it would open up uh, the vaccination to middle and high schoolers. Um, is there a plan in place to kind of jump on that as we did with the teachers and get to the schools and, and the parents? Just curious. Yeah, we, uh, we have been anticipating this and uh, do have a plan in place. I'll let uh, Secretary Smith describe. Yeah, Stephen, you'll probably see a hybrid model where you can have the option of going to a mass clinic or uh, we'll have some options going to the schools as well. So you'll probably see a hybrid model as we move forward. We'll be ready to uh, move forward on this plan as we were with the, eight, um, the 16 to 18 year olds and as we were with uh, everyone else on this. But it'll, it'll, it, given the age of this, it has to be a little bit more of a hybrid model. Okay, so how does that work? Parents, uh, maybe a, a sheet goes home with the kids and the parents sign off on it. Yeah, or the parents can come, the parents maybe in, in if it's a mass vac site, the, the parents accompany the, the children. Um, even at a school site, maybe the parent would want to accompany the child as they move forward. I think those are the things, you know, the, the details of a parent-child relationship that we're just going to have to work through in the next uh, two days. Any sort of reward incentive, i.e. <laughs> free recess, something like that? I don't know. We, we have discussed incentives, but I don't think you need an incentive to get a vaccine. Um, a a, a life-saving vaccine, I think, is uh, incentive enough. Go to the phones now, starting with Stuart Ledbetter, NBC5. Good morning. Uh, colleges are trying to figure out the fall plan, and locally, I, I'm the only one I'm aware of that, that has uh, decided to... Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Go ahead, Stuart. Sorry. Oh, I'm... I'm Sorry, there was some noise. Uh, regarding requiring vaccinations for returning students this fall, do you have any recommendations for Vermont colleges on what they should do? Yeah, you know, this is a discussion that's happening uh, nationwide, and uh, I think there is going to be a, a path forward for those who are uh, those universities and colleges, uh, and I and I think it's necessary. Uh, I think that's. Uh, creating a path where there's going to be more normalcy in the fall. Um, maybe Dr. Lean can answer further, but, uh, but again, what do you think is this is uh, part of the future? <clears throat> there are already five schools in Vermont that have uh, voiced uh, the idea of mandating vaccine for the fall. Um, so the movement is already beginning. There are over 100 schools in the country, and I'm sure that number has increased since the news report of 100 came out. Um, so I think the, the academic university college community is speaking with its actions uh, and saying that they would prefer to have normal operations or operations as close to what normal used to be. And to do that effectively, they want to make sure that they have a vaccinated student body. They have a lot of issues to still, you know, get through in terms of uh, their faculty, their staff. Uh, colleges uh, are big places, employ a lot of individuals. Um, so they'll have a lot of other things to address. But certainly, um, the discussion is going to colleges, it's going to the business community. Um, it's, it's very early in the stages right now in this country, but it's being talked about with sufficient vigor 
that I think uh, we're seeing a lot of actions on that front. Um, whatever, with whatever advice a, a state would give, uh, the fact of the matter is uh, those communities are already speaking. All right. Thank you very much. Lisa Rathke, the Associated Press. Uh, thank you. Um, the Health Department mentioned that there are more clinics taking um, walk-ins. I was wondering, are people taking advantage of those? And is there any way to sort of target those to this uh, younger group that you're concerned about? Yeah, we definitely want to meet them where they are. And uh, we are seeing some success. We saw that in Barton when we had uh, the drive through uh, type of approach. And we had walking that, you have to work for you. Which, which was uh, essential oh, uh, and part of the success. Secretary Smith, anything to add to that? Lisa, walk-ins are going to be, um, we're doing it because a lot of people want convenience and walk-ins uh, provides that convenience. We're encouraging walk-ins in all our clinics now. So when I listed all those uh, sites that will be doing uh, vaccinations in the next week uh, or so, I said that uh, most of them would be accepting walk-ins. and. And the drive-ups uh, to the speedways, for example, at Devil's Bowl and others, is um, walk-ins only. Um, we, as the governor mentioned in Barton, we saw enormous success with walk-ins, and so we're um, we're taking this tack where we're uh, including walk-ins in our strategy in terms of our vaccination. And uh, as I as I mentioned in my opening remarks. We're transitioning from that mass clinic sort of uh, concept to uh, these opportunities at various venues and opening these various venues up uh, to walk-ins. Uh, I, I think I, I think that will help in the age group that we're uh, looking at to target, which is the 18 to 29 year olds. And did you notice if, if you had um, more a significant amount of that age group in the Barton clinic? Yeah, I haven't. I haven't looked at the the demographics in that. That's a good question that I will look at. Um, but it just it just goes. Um, if we take the vaccine where where they are, um, it just goes uh, for reason that we'll uh, we'll pick up that age group. And one of the things I mentioned is going to various venues. We've been talking about Church Street having a, a vaccination site on Church Street uh, on occasion maybe down at the waterfront as well uh, in Burlington, but that, not only Burlington, but elsewhere throughout the state where there are people that get together in downtown areas and various things like that. Um, we're, we really want to make sure that Vermont stays number one and that we get as many people vaccinated as possible, as Dr. Levine said. The more that we can get people vaccinated, the better it is for the state, the better it is for the country. Okay, thank you. Cameron Paquette, St. Albans Messenger. Hi there, this is a question for the governor. Um, I wanted to ask about, you've mentioned potential um, for uh, asking for more vaccines in the federal allocation. I was wondering, what is Vermont's current cap? And what could you see as the asking for? We could ask, well, our current cap is we've been uh, been allocated based on population. Um, I think that's been around, I shouldn't say this, I, I think it's around 20,000 per week, um, but, but we can get you the exact number. Uh, what the uh, what they had said is you could uh, you could ask for as much as 50 percent more on a weekly basis. So if you saw a need uh, where you're having more demand uh, or you're having a, a mass uh, vax clinic clinic of some sort and needed more uh, vaccine, uh, you could ask for that up to 50 percent. Uh, and it really does depend on uh, on how much is in the federal pool. Uh, but I will add, you know, we're a small state. Uh, and uh, asking for up to maybe 10,000 doses wouldn't be a big ask uh, for us in, in some respects on a federal level. So um, I think this is a, uh, an improvement of the system. If, uh, if it's not being used in other areas, uh, we would 
we would then just make the ask and we would get that uh, the following week uh, and we would know within a day or two whether that uh, they could commit to that. All right, and I also have a question from the reader here um, regarding schools. So um, I believe under the current CDC guidelines, if school, if a school can't return to in-person, then it's recommended some form of remote learning be offered. Um, you know, depending on how vaccination rates go um, and if the vaccine is opened up to younger age groups, I mean, could Vermont potentially allow some leeway on that CDC guidance to allow more in-person uh, if there are, do you happen to be some schools that um, can't quite get back to full in person? Um, well, we're encouraging all schools to get back to in person uh, even before the end of the school year. There's still time. Um, so that fits into our strategy. And uh, hopefully by fall, <clears throat> we'll uh, be able to offer that age range that was uh, mentioned, the 12. Uh, 12 and over uh, so that uh, that shouldn't be a question and we know that there I think Moderna is doing some trials uh, for a younger uh, population I think it's 6 to 12 uh, at this point in time so there may be some more good news uh, by fall in that regard so, so I everything points to uh, we should be back to I would think almost all in-person instruction by fall Great, thank you. Andrew McGregor, Caledonian Record. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, this one for Secretary Smith. Um, now that the vaccine is available to everyone and there's uh, at least potential walk-ins at every clinic, does the health department website allow Vermonters to search and, and view the entire list of clinics without having to create an account and log in to the registration system? I think that would lower the bar for awareness and access. Yeah, I'll check. I'll check into that um, and see if there's a. Now that we're doing walk-ins, you know, as it, uh, the way that we have been doing it is, you log into the system, uh, you register um, for walk-ins. Let me just. Uh, take a look at that's a good question let me take a look at it make sure we adjust um, our sort of forward approaching and making sure that the list of, um, of clinics is out there I think it is on the website but I will I will double check okay. if it is it's it's pretty well buried okay um, uh, and my follow-up question is when someone does uh, choose to register and go looking for an appointment what's the average um, What's the average delay from when someone logs in and schedules an appointment to when they actually receive their first dose now? Yeah, it's about two weeks. Still two weeks? So, yeah. so maybe the best option is to look for a log in? Well, there, you know, it depends on where you are. Um, I say on average two weeks, but you can find clinics, if depending on where you want to drive, you can find clinics that are going to be quicker than that. Um, I say I say two weeks not to overpromise. To be honest with you. Okay. Thank you. Lisa Loomis, the Valley Reporter. Good afternoon. My first question is about the Vermont cases by age slide, and this on today's slide deck, it shows for the last three weeks the highest number of cases in those 20 to 29 year olds. 20 to 29 years old. The second highest number of cases is between the 10 and 19 year olds. Is it possible to get any further breakdown on the ages in that 10 to 19 year old age band? Are we really seeing a significant increase in cases in 10 to 12 to 13 year olds? I'll let uh, Commissioner Pichak answer that. Yeah, so Lisa, that is something we certainly can provide you. We provided these 10-year these increments just, um, you know, to be uniform with a lot of other measurements. But I know uh, even though those cases have gone up, cases in schools have been low uh, with April vacation. Uh, and then even this week, they were relatively low compared to, to uh, past weeks. But again, those age groups are still um, disproportionately high uh, in terms of the cases that they're seeing. So happy to provide, uh, whether it's next Tuesday or whether it's to you directly, happy to provide a further breakdown uh, of those um, by the age that you'd like. So 
Still there, Lisa? I think they lost the connection at the conference. Uh, I heard someone just say my name. Yeah, yeah Julie, it's Mike Sherling. Uh, I was going to say the same thing. It sounds like the conference dropped, so we should hold for a minute, I think. Hello? You're still there, Lisa. We hear you. Uh, uh, okay. Can you repeat your most recent question? It might have dropped for a second. Yeah, my, I think Commissioner Ptech did answer my first question. My second question is probably for Commissioner Harrington. A reader who was a state employee received a letter from the unemployment office about a fraudulent claim. While talking to someone at the call center, she verified that the hackers had her driver's license number, mailing address, and her state salary level. She wanted to know which databases the hackers had access to and what other personal information may have been compromised. Hi, uh, sorry for that, just getting to my mute button. Um, to your specific question, it's not necessarily that they have access to a specific state database, um, but uh, what we are finding is that uh, hackers, if you will, or uh, fraudsters are pulling from compromised data that could go as far back as 10, 15 years. It could be as part of um, you know, some other large national data breach. I think at some point, all of us have probably been informed along the way that our data may have been compromised by either some uh, large online shopping store or some other um, instance. Uh, so from that perspective, what we're actually seeing is people, um, you know, we, we do know that Experian at one point had been uh, breached in years past. So that would be another instance where someone could identify um, that those data pieces. Uh, so from that perspective, um, it doesn't take much in the, in the world of lost data to come up with a name, a social security number, a date of birth, a mailing address, um, someone's income, um, because they're reported at so many different levels and so many different points. I would also say that um, you know state employee salaries are also public information and can be found openly on the web. Um, so if they knew that this person uh, was a state employee um, and and wanted to file using that information, they could also pull that information in um, by searching the um, the public database. Uh, for employee salaries. So, um, but what we're finding is it's more of a coordinated national and international crime ring, and they're pulling on old data uh, from large institutions that could be compromised any time in the past. Um, it's not necessarily that there was some um, state database or anything locally that was essentially compromised that led to this. Do these people need to take any new or extra security precautions? Will they be receiving any? monitoring as the people who had the fraudulent or the incorrect 1099s sent out so it were yeah i want to uh, i want to draw a clear distinction there um you know the issue with the 1099 situation um was due to uh, a circumstance that occurred um by the department and on behalf of the state and so you know we felt um, obligated to provide protection to these individuals due to the error that occurred. Um, in this case, um, you know, this is simply someone outside of the department um, getting their hands on private information and then using that to try to file a claim. And we are stopping, I would say, a majority of the fraudulent filings, but the data that they're using didn't come from the department or didn't come from the state in any way. That was data that was compromised probably through some other third party vendor or loss of data. Um, so I, I do encourage people and I would encourage people to look at our website. We have sent fraud alerts and notices um, out over the past week and a half, uh, including press releases to the, to the media about what um, individuals should do, uh, not only if they believe they've been subject to UI fraud, but just in fraud in general. The easiest thing they can do or, or the first thing they should do is if they believe they've been subject to fraud and someone has filed a fraudulent claim, they should contact the department. They should complete our online uh, web form uh, fraud report uh, that will go to our fraud team so we can stop the claim. Um, an individual that has a fraudulent claim filed on their behalf is held uh, harmless in those cases. So we stop the claim and we work with law enforcement um, to pass information on so they can pursue 
investigation, um, but we do not hold the individual whose identity was stolen, um, you know, uh, in any type of, of uh, you know, trying to recapture money from them uh, due to no fault of their own. So um, they're usually held harmless in those circumstances. I will say that we know that, um, you know, this is a good indication for folks to, and we know that it means someone else has their information, so um, they should be taking necessary steps to protect their information, whether that's just simply um, monitoring closely their financial accounts and credit information. They can also put on a free uh, temporary security freeze on their credit, um, or they could choose, um, you know, at their own cost to, to enroll in some type of identity protection. Um, but this is in line with what we are seeing nationally, um, and it's impacting, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of uh, Americans across the country. Um, and it seems to be just moving from state to state using people's identity to try to receive uh, benefits. Thank you very much. That's it for me. Mike Donahue, the Islander. Uh, thanks, Jason. Uh, Governor, uh, we've had some questions about when the legislature will be going home this year, and uh, apparently word is they're going to take at least another extra week uh, past the planned deadline. Uh, readers we've heard from say they're concerned that the legislative session was supposed to be designed primarily for COVID issues, but the legislators have in fact strayed to other topics that weren't COVID related or even urgent issues. And now this morning, we heard they may plan to bring the legislators back for four more weeks sometime in the fall. I'm just wondering what you've heard and what the expenses to the taxpayers uh, for each day that they are in session. Um, well, obviously, I don't control the legislature, uh, so this is uh, whatever they decide to do. Um, they made the claim early on that they were going to focus on the uh, COVID-related issues, uh, and I would say that they have strayed away from that a bit. Um, in terms of uh, coming back, uh, again, I would just remind everyone uh, there are still opportunities for um, vetoes, uh, to be honest, perfectly honest with you. Uh, and they would have to come back. I think they have a veto date, uh, a veto override date of uh, sometime in late June. Um, so they may be coming back then. Um, and they are uh, considering, from what I've heard, uh, maybe coming back in October. Uh, based on what we may learn uh, from the federal government, there is a, an infrastructure package that uh, President Biden is considering, Congress is going to be taking up. And if there is any movement there, I think the legislature has an interest in coming back then. But time will tell. That's uh, totally up to them, separate branch of government. Do you know or can you find out, maybe even for next time, I realize it may not be right in your memory here, but <clears throat> what percentage of bills that have been forwarded to you are actually COVID-related this year? I don't. I don't have that, uh, Mike. But uh, we can take a. Yeah, no, we can take a look. Next time. Yeah, we can take a look. Yeah. Okay. And just one follow-up from the other day. <clears throat> we have, in fact, heard from some more state employees since the press conference that they are, in fact, have been asked about whether they have the vaccine or have to prove it. Uh, in light of. The responses from the other day one state employee is wondering if it's possible for somebody in authority whether it's human resources commissioner or the uh, secretary of administration to send a memo out to all the state employees and especially the supervisors so it's clear that asking about shots and demanding written proof is outside the bounds uh, from what I understood the answer to be. I understand, you know, word of mouth is hard to, to do when you're spreading it to six or 7,000 state employees, but it seems this person seemed to think the memo might be a good way of posting it on the state website. Maybe uh, Secretary Young may be on the line and could comment on this. 
Uh, thank you, Governor. I am on the line. Thank you, Mike. Uh, I, I personally am not aware of the um, situations that you're mentioning where employees have been, been asked. And I will uh, circle back to our Commissioner of Human Resources and find out what communications, if any, have been sent to date and uh, um, follow up on, on that idea uh, and think about what we can do. Great. Thank you very much, everybody. Appreciate it. Cat, WCAX. Hi. So for the walk-in clinics that are the two-dose shots, how does that work for a follow-up? Do people make appointments on site for that second dose, or do you plan a second walk-in clinic for a few weeks after in that same location? I'll let Secretary Smith answer that. That's a great question, Kat, and one we've been working out the last few days. Uh, we'll make an appointment uh, for those people uh, in a follow-up clinic. Um, we're just working out the logistics now. But yeah, that, that's basically what it would do. We would either assign them a clinic that we already know about, or we would do a follow-up clinic and make sure we notify them. But they will, they will know where they have to go and what, what they have to do to get their second shot. Are you concerned at all that people who did walk-ins for the convenience factor may not show up for their second dose? I, I'm not that concerned. If they're showing up for their first dose, they'll show up for their second dose. I mean, um, why show up for your first dose if you're not going to show up for your second dose? We, we've had limited um, limited people that have not showed up for their second dose. So there isn't a huge um, uh, sort of number of people who have not shown up for their second dose in our experience since, since December. Uh, there are some, but the, they, they, it isn't a huge number. So I don't, I, I don't foresee us having an issue with, with that, whether it's walk-in or whether it's a a, a mass clinic or a drive up or anything else. If it's a drive up, uh, obviously we'll have to do a second clinic on a drive up. But the, um, you know, I, I, I just don't see that as an issue. And then how is the state accounting for people who get their shots in another state? So I had a viewer who asked this question after saying, you know, hey, I never told anyone in Florida anything about having a Vermont address when I got my vaccine there. And I have to assume on the Upper Valley side that some Vermonters are getting their shots in New Hampshire. So are we potentially more vaccinated than our numbers show, or do we have a really definitive way that we keep track of when people get their shots in other states? Yeah, the, with healthcare facilities, it's a lot easier to answer that. The answer is yes, we get, we get notified from a healthcare uh, facility in, in sort of the registry. We get notified by primary care if it's done in another state as well. What we're doing now is following up the databases along the border. For example, New Hampshire, um, and, and more particular, we're just making sure that we capture everybody in Essex County um, and that we are going to the pharmacies now and asking for uh, records from the pharmacy on the New Hampshire side. As you know, about three weeks ago, New Hampshire allowed anybody to come and get vaccinated in their state. Um, we're just making sure that we capture those people and bring them bring them forward. But to, that's where the complication comes in. In terms of healthcare facilities, uh, Dartmouth, for example, regularly reports other hospitals on the other side regularly report other healthcare facilities regularly report. Um, and we're just getting the notification from the CDC in the next week or so where we'll get also um, Department of Defense data uh, for Vermonters, National Guard, for example, and uh, VA data uh, that will be coming our way. So we'll have a more complete picture uh, of this as we move forward. But it sounds like there is some opportunity for someone who like, got vaccinated in Florida, which is not obviously yeah. the border of Vermont, the, the, to potentially not be counted in Vermont. There, there are some, there is some, there is some potential for that. We think it's limited. Great, thank you. Greg Lanero, the county courier. Good afternoon, Governor and staff. Uh, quick follow-up on the identity theft question. Uh, I think Lisa was the one that asked it. 
uh, one of the one of the replies to the question was that the information could have been stolen from people 10 or 15 years ago, and and that kind of hurt my ears up because the state breach in data from the from the health from the labor department uh, covered those people for identity of theft protection for one year. Uh, I'm wondering if if the state should actually be covering those people for a decade or two with identity theft protection. Commissioner Harrington, I don't know if you have any more information on that. I, I thought that was offered for more than that one year. It, you're correct, Governor. Um, it's actually more than a year. Uh, we don't typically announce what the full term is um, simply so we don't uh, inform the fraudsters who are typically listening in uh, when it will lapse or end. Um, I do think it becomes a challenge, as you know, uh, with uh, people being able to hold on to data for that long. Um, COVID is a pretty unique circumstance in this regard. Um, and I think what we did look at is what is the industry standard, um, what is recommended both by our insurance company as well as um, identity protection services that were out there. And that's how we landed on um, the, the amount and length of coverage, um, you know, which is, is pretty standard uh, to my understanding um, when there is some type of, of data loss. Uh, do the people know, do the people that you're protecting know how long they're protected for? Yes, they do. Okay. And, and I would use this opportunity actually to remind folks that um, if they were a claimant in the 2020 calendar year, uh, they are still eligible to enroll in ID theft protection. Uh, and they have until May 19th to be able to do that um, and before, uh, before that window closes. Okay, um, and uh, this may be a question for Mike Sherling uh, or, or the governor, I'm not sure. Um, listening in to the local municipal, uh, and person testimony recently that there's some understaffing issues at the, the VSP barracks in St. Albans, which after our discussions close to a year ago, uh, certainly you know, brings up the question, how understaffed is the state police? And from an administration's point of view, is that how you're helping to balance the budget? And, and is this uh, understaffing issue improving? Um, a, a couple of things. I think uh, it's important to recognize we have uh, staffing issues throughout the state in all different sectors, private and public uh, uh, combined. Um, I'll, I'll ask, maybe I'll ask uh, Commissioner Sherling and then uh, possibly um, Secretary Young as well to comment on this. Uh, we opened up uh, four positions. We had a freeze on uh, during the pandemic, uh, but we have opened up and uh, we're uh, at this point in time, uh, trying to hire more state employees. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for the question, Mike Sherling from Public Safety. The, uh, the the freeze that was in place during COVID did not affect one position in the state police or emergency communications dispatchers. Uh, as the governor indicated, uh, staffing uh, and workforce is an issue in all sectors. It is uh, an increasing concern in law enforcement in particular, not only in the state police, but uh, across the entire array of law enforcement in, uh, in Vermont and beyond. Um, that it's been a challenge for uh, more than a decade. Uh, that challenge is uh, being exacerbated on a week-to-week -week basis at this stage. Uh, in terms of the state police staffing, um, you know, the challenges continue. Uh, I, I wouldn't uh, indicate that we're at a, a crisis level at this point, but each barracks is dealing with uh, vacancies in a variety of different areas. Um, and uh, you know, the, the hiring uh, pool is shrinking. And uh, so for anybody listening who is uh, who's interested in a, uh, a career uh, serving your community, um, both uh, state police and uh, in other municipal departments and sheriff's offices, there are a variety of vacancies available. 
Can I get a list of those vacancies? I, uh, if you send us uh, a message, I will follow up with you. I agree. Um, I think that's probably it for now. I appreciate your time, and uh, thank you, Governor. Yeah, thanks, uh, Greg. Uh, Secretary Young, is there anything you wanted to add to that? Uh, Governor, I think I could just add that we did have a hiring freeze um, that had uh, quite a few exceptions, including law enforcement and, and positions critical to the emergency response and operations. So I know we have been recruiting and, and um, hiring throughout the last year in some key positions. We did open it up. Um, about I think maybe two to three weeks ago and we're starting to recruit and I think we'll have some better data uh, in in the next few weeks as to whether we're seeing a short of shortage of applicants as we've now opened up the entire workforce um, for recruitment and Wallace Allen seven days hi thanks governor uh, do you support removing the the year 2020 from the calculation for the unemployment trust fund goal. Um, as you know, the, the size of the trust fund um, is based on um, the year, you know, how, how many people apply for unemployment in a year. And if 2020 is in the goal, the trust fund would jump from 500 million to a billion. And um, I know lawmakers are looking at this right now in health commerce. Yeah, um, as you also know, and this was something that we started talking with the legislature about before the session started and said that it was imperative uh, that we take action on this, and they had said they would. Uh, it's still stalled uh, as of right now, which is uh, critical in, in, this, uh, in this time uh, because, as you said, uh, this is going to, if we don't do something now, uh, this is going to further impact a, a struggling uh, business climate here in Vermont and uh, um, through no fault of their own. So uh, I do uh, support taking action on this. I think uh, removing 2020 uh, is reasonable. I think that uh, that gets to where we are. We may have to take uh, further action later, but that would uh, that would help right now. Um, but we provided language, we provided uh, testimony, uh, and we're doing everything we can uh, to to get the legislature to take this up and solve this issue, just just this one issue. You don't have to combine it with all the other initiatives within uh, multiple bills. Just to take care of this one issue because it's uh, it's critical right now. Uh, Commissioner Harrington, I might uh, ask, as far as you're concerned, I think there's a date uh, that we need to take action, or uh, this goes into effect, and we have no choice. Uh, but to uh, to ask uh, the business community to step up. That's correct, Governor. Um, as you mentioned, we brought this up actually um, last year uh, around September um, with the various uh, committees of jurisdiction. We typically begin the process of assigning tax rates to individual businesses beginning in March um, and into April. We postponed that work um, in hopes that the, the legislature would move forward um, and, and act um, to provide um, some necessary immediate relief uh, to employers um, and are still waiting for that to happen. So we are um, on a very short timeline right now um, in order for us to set the tax rate um, slot the individual businesses and inform them prior to July 1st when the new tax rate would take effect. Um, and so we are, you know, roughly about a, a week or so away from needing to uh, set that rate or set the tax schedule, if you will, um, and without action uh, by the legislature, we will end up in tax schedule five, um, going from one, which is the lowest, to tax schedule five, which is the highest. Um, and, and as you said, our fear is that this will be um, a burden that, that some businesses uh, can't withstand, and, and we're trying to avoid that at all costs. And I might also add, uh, this is directly related to COVID. Uh, and this should be prioritized. It should have been prioritized long before now. 
All right, yeah, thank you. Um, this other question is a little bit less, is a little easier. Um, for people who are um, working outdoors, does your relaxation of the mask mandate include them? That if they're they're doing their jobs outdoors, they don't have to wear masks? Yeah, it's uh, it sounds easier, um, but uh, it may get complicated um, by OSHA. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are looking into that at this point in time. Uh, obviously, uh, those who have uh, the Occupational Safety and Health Act uh, takes precedent over almost everything. Um, but uh, we're asking the business community to use some common sense. We have relaxed our policy in terms of uh, not having to wear a mask outside if you can keep six feet away from someone else. Uh, but that doesn't uh, provide for those who need to wear a mask uh, on a job site, for, let's say, uh, with, uh, with some of the requirements uh, by uh, OSHA and VOSHA. So uh, again, we'll provide more guidance on this. I know it's been an issue with some of the businesses, and uh, we need to react to that to provide some clarity. Um. You, do you just have the power to say, okay, you don't have to do it anymore? No, um, because we are under uh, the OSHA, which is a federal requirement. The Occupational Safety and Health Act is uh, a federal uh, requirement on any job site. Um, so, and uh, that impacts employers directly. So we don't have, uh, ours doesn't supersede theirs. Uh, they take precedent. So when you say we need to react to that, what can well, you do? Because I think that there's there's some confusion as to what we're asking or what we're allowing. Uh, and again, if you could, uh, uh, if you could, let's just say it this way. And we'll again, we'll provide more clarity. But if you were on a job site before COVID, and uh, you could go without a mask, uh, then you can go without a mask now. Um, that's my interpretation. Uh, but we want to make sure that we provide the best guidance forward. If you had to wear a mask before COVID on a job site, you're going to have to wear a mask now. So again, that's the type of clarity I'm, I'm hoping that we can provide. Got it. Thank you. Joseph Gresser, The Barton Chronicle. Hello. Um, I think this might be for Secretary Smith. Uh, I'm curious, do you have figures that uh, will show whether there are any doses of the Johnson & Johnson left over after the Barton Clinic or whether you got enough walk-ins to use up the entire supply? Well, I think we had enough uh, for about 400 and we had less than that show up, but we didn't, um, we didn't dispose of those. We utilized them in other clinics, so they didn't go to waste. No, I, I didn't. I just was curious as to whether um, when uh, uh, Secretary Smith was talking about success, whether you had that level of success or something left. Uh, as I recall, there were uh, 215 uh, appointments. And yeah, I think we had, uh, it, there was uh, under 400 in the end, but I think we had over maybe 100 walk-ins. Uh, and it was pretty remarkable if you think about it. We, we didn't... Uh, we didn't even open this clinic up until 10 a.m. on a Saturday. Uh, and then uh, on Tuesday, it was open. I mean, that, that was just to register. So this was by uh, the media and word of mouth and our, our website and social media and so forth. Uh, but to get that many people into an area uh, that has a, a very a small population, I think the population of, of, uh, of uh, Essex County is somewhere around uh, six to 8,000 people. So that's, I think that's, we did pretty well. Yes, I, I'm not gonna dispute that. Um, it was very full. Um, a second question, and maybe this is for Dr. Levine, but I'm not guessing right today, um, is about the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine and whether he has any idea whether they will ever ask for emergency authorization in the United States, and if not, whether that might um, affect people's willingness to take it in other parts of the world, given that it's uh, 
less expensive and easier to store and use than uh, Pfizer and Moderna. Yeah, I think that is a uh, Dr. Levine question, but I will also say that your first question was a Secretary Smith question. I was just able to answer it. Okay. Well, thank you. I need to get him to keep answering my questions, too. <laughs> <laughs> so. So I don't have a great deal of insight into what the AstraZeneca executives are, are doing or discussing with the federal government. Uh, I do know that as you've kind of characterized it, they, they certainly aren't um, rushing into the EUA process. Um, and now, as you can see, we're at a stage of vaccination in the country where I'm not sure how much difference it would make because uh, we have a lot of vaccine or the other three platforms, and they're all, um, except in the eight states that I mentioned, they're all uh, in states that are having decreasing uh, vaccination rates. But nonetheless, the stockpile of AstraZeneca in our country is rather large, um, and the investment that was made by our government to get doses uh, ahead of time, just like they did with some of the other companies, so I do know that a lot of that is going to be shipped to other parts of the world, knowing that it's received approval in many other um, countries of the world, uh, and there are places that desperately need vaccine. So it's certainly going to be sent other places, even if it doesn't get the EUA here or go for the EUA here. And I don't think that's going to um, impair its use I mean, there are select countries that have not, have said they're not going to use it. One was Denmark, I believe. The other was South Africa, but that was much more because of its performance against the variant that's in South Africa. But uh, there are plenty of parts of the world that could use it and um, should use it. Uh, and I believe that's an important thing that our country will be doing to uh, encourage its use. But I don't know if they're on an EUA schedule at all or if it will be. Can't, can't answer that. Well, thank you very much. Aaron Tanko, Vermont Digger. Hi. It, it sounds like, um, you know, you guys are, are kind of pushing for Vermont to still try to aim for herd immunity or something close to it, um, even if the rest of the nation has a low vaccination rate. But what would it mean for Vermont long term if we have herd immunity and the rest of the country doesn't? Um, you know, we certainly get a lot of out-of-state visitors and tourists. You know, what, what are the implications of, of, of Vermont kind of being this island of herd immunity um, in the rest of the nation. Yeah, I think it makes it even all that more imperative for us to protect ourselves, uh, you know, and we can do that pretty easily by receiving the vaccination. So if we can protect ourselves, uh, the more people we can get to do that, uh, the better off we're going to be. Because as you said, uh, we are affected by uh, a number of high population centers around us. We, we want tourism. Uh, we need it uh, here in the state. So. Um, but it'd be, you know, again, imperative uh, that we protect ourselves in order to do that. That's what we need. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Uh, the other factor that is, um, if we protect ourselves to that degree, there will be very little um, virus transmission within the state of Vermont. There will be some, because there will be everywhere. Um, it's still believed that this is going to become sort of an endemic virus where it doesn't, doesn't disappear, but it's around. Uh, so even if somebody from a less well-vaccinated area comes into the state uh, with the virus, it isn't going to go very far. And while it may impact that individual who had it in the first place, its ability to be transmitted across the population of Vermont um, is going to be limited, and we're still going to be very protected from that. So we shouldn't see a lot of variant strains coming in and then proliferating, because the only way they proliferate is to have unvaccinated people to be transmitted to. So that would be the goal. So uh, 
it shouldn't deter us from trying to achieve our own goals in Vermont of trying to have as much community immunity as possible. Uh, and, that, and that's the course we're headed on. Uh, so that's, that's how I look at that. All right. Um, so New Jersey recently announced this um, rather viral get a shot and get a beer uh, campaign where people who are vaccinated can get free beer from certain breweries. And it reminded me of a, um, you know, planned idea from long ago that people might be able to get a free creamy coupon from getting vaccinated. Whatever happened to that? Oh, that, that idea is alive and well. Um, and we're just figuring out where to deploy it, actually. Um, I believe the number is in the 10,000 creamy coupon range. So um, stay tuned. Uh, those will be available. Um, I, I think they're not being used as a incentive so much, uh, more a reward, I would say, um, because, um, well, I mean, everybody wants a creamy, especially on a hot spring or summer day. But the reality is, I don't think that's going to make the difference in someone's decision. But at the same time, why shouldn't they get rewarded if they happen to be there? So we're going to be able to um, deploy those, and we just have to figure out how to operationalize that. I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know if students really like that free food. I, I, <laughs> I could definitely see it as an incentive rather than a reward. But uh, yeah, thank you. Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, Governor. You mentioned earlier in this press conference about the uh, potential veto session, and I was wondering about the uh, the budget bill. Basically, they've they've cut in half the the amount of ARPA funding at, at this moment, at this speaking anyway. Uh, they're willing to spend this year, and also they've also cut back some of your plans. But would would that Assuming that it was just cut in half and they're saving half for next year, would that work for you, or, is, no, or do you really need? Yeah. There's some other factors um, that are showstoppers in some respect for me. Um, one of them being both the Senate and the House uh, took a portion of the rooms and meals tax that we had dedicated for water quality, and they are uh, supplementing ARPA money for that six points uh, on the uh, something we agreed to uh, two years ago is it was uh, uh, it was uh, I guess well received uh, by the EPA by CLF by everyone uh, we had struggled with that as you might remember we struggled for years uh, trying to agree on a funding source I think the legislature had wanted to uh, create a new I mean I remember all the different uh, initiatives to create a new tax in order to, to satisfy uh, the, the uh, water quality um, um, issue that we were facing. So um, I kept saying that we had enough capacity within the system to do that. And we finally came to agreement on that and, and used uh, uh, six points of the, uh, of the rooms and meals uh, to do that. Well, now they're taking that away for they're saying five years and they're going to uh, supplement ARPA money, which doesn't get us, from my perspective, doesn't get us any further on water quality because you're taking away uh, the money source. You're just using um, some creative counting to do it uh, and to free up uh, other money for other purposes. So uh, that um, that's something that I couldn't agree to. And uh, I'm still looking, you know, we have enough money in the system. As I said before, back in January, we had a $200 million surplus. And uh, there were a number of initiatives, one-time initiatives that I put forward in the budget that I presented. And uh, since then, uh, the surplus has grown. It looks like it's going to be uh, to the magnitude maybe 300, could get up to 400 million uh, in the end. So there's no reason to play this shell game. You know, we can, they can get what they want and use some of the surplus money uh, that we know is going to be there. Uh, they don't have to use ARPA, this one time money. Think of it as taking a loan out. Uh, you wouldn't use loan money uh, to, f to fulfill budgetary, ongoing budgetary concerns. Uh, and this is the, the way I look at this. 
This is a once in a lifetime opportunity for us. We can't blow this, we can't squander it. We have to, to have a plan in place, and, and I haven't seen a plan either. I mean, I put forth a plan on how I would spend the billion dollars over the next four years, and uh, I haven't seen anything from the legislature yet. So they moved in the right direction. Uh, they did provide for more transparency, which I appreciate. Um, and they did reduce uh, some of the, uh, the money that was spent for ARPA. Uh, but, but again, we haven't even received the, um, the instructions from the Treasury yet either, nor have we received the money. So uh, we have a long ways to go. Uh, I'm hopeful the House uh, will take a, another look at this and see how we can all get what we need out of this budget, because I, I think there's enough money there. It's just a question of how we're spending that money. Well, they have to move pretty quickly at this point, right? I mean, what, what, what would be the deadline for the, you know, the House the Conference Committee to come through with a plan that would be acceptable? Well, they don't, there's, I mean, they can stay there as long as they want to get this right. <laughs> or they can come back in, in June and we'll, we'll take care of it then. Okay, thank you, Governor. Devin Bates, Local 22, Local 44. Yeah, I had a question for Dr. Levine. Um, I'm seeing that Pfizer plans to file for a full U.S. approval, um, and the differences there would allow them to market directly to consumers, and it could make the booster shots available to the public later on without needing to go through the emergency authorization again. Um, my question is, as you know, we're talking about trying to reduce vaccine hesitancy, um, even though that's to a lesser degree here in Vermont, uh, do you think a full authorization would move the needle on that at all and convince some people who are on the fence? And are there any other aspects of this full authorization process that you're watching? Yeah, so you're talking about going from an EUA to an approval state, I assume, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, so, you know, I, I frankly don't think within Vermont there is that kind of resistance to vaccination that would be determined by people thinking that an EUA is an experimental kind of thing, uh, because uh, we've educated a lot, and EUA actually still requires a lot of uh, check marks on a lot of boxes um, with regard to effectiveness and safety. So <clears throat> this is about that time in the natural cycle when you would hope that a approval could occur because of the number of months the vaccine's been in use, and more importantly, the number of months follow up from the original studies where the vaccine's been in use. So I don't think that's going to tip the balance in Vermont. I think Vermonters are, um, uh, have been accepting of all of the science that we provided them to this point in time. With regard to the booster, you know, a booster still requires an approval process. It's not you know, uh, Dr. Woodcock, from who's the interim FDA uh, commissioner, has been careful to say it's nothing like what they went through to get the first approval, um, and it's uh, it, it's it's fairly um, brisk and doesn't require a lot of uh, pre-work, if you will, uh, especially because the booster would either be extremely similar, if not the same as the original, or it would if it's the mRNA vaccine, perhaps be adjusted a little to account for one or two of the variant strains that might be present at the time. So that process is going to be uh, very quick. And um, frankly, um, by the time anyone would require a booster, which would be a minimum of six months after the first shot, and most people are talking further, nine, 12 months, um, I think a lot of these vaccines will have already been formally approved uh, just by the passage of time uh, being appropriate for their approval to come up. All right, and then a question for Secretary Smith as well. I was wondering if you could just uh, kind of dive into a little bit what we're seeing through the first uh, few days or weeks at these walking clinics and some of the metrics you're looking for as um, the state decides where to expand this to other ways um, that this can be used to, to reach people in rural locations, et cetera. Um, what have you seen in the early stages of this and how does it um, bode for sort of the future of walk-ins? I think it bodes well for the future of walk-ins. We saw this uh, success in Barton. As you know, we are going to be using 
walk-ins exclusively on the drive-ins uh, at the speedway. So I think what we're gonna see is um, a lot of success in the areas of walk-ins. When we have opportunities in a, in a clinic now, we are planning for walk-ins. Now, not all clinics have walk-ins at this moment, but I think in the future, you'll see most clinics will have walk-ins. And for example, all the college um, lists that I had, which is quite extensive and, and throughout the state, we've made uh, provisions for walk-ins there and as well um, in Essex County. Now we'll be using Johnson & Johnson in Essex County, so it's one shot. We don't have to worry about the second shot in, uh, in Essex County. So, you know, these sort of things that we're uh, talking about, I think, um, are, are the future. Bringing the vaccine to the people um, instead of these, uh, you know, through these various venues that we've been talking about. I, I'm pretty excited about it, and I think, uh, I think the demographic that we're looking at, um, those that are looking for convenience and ease, I think really this this option is attractive to to them. Great, thank you. I, I just wanted to to add, um, you know, Barton was eye opening for us. Uh, we had put that in into play in a short period of time, and um, we decided to try uh, the the drive in walk in type approach uh, as well because we were using the Johnson and Johnson. Um, the, uh, the vaccine uh, that is like a one and done uh, type of uh, vaccination process. So uh, it lent itself well. Uh, we were trying to experiment a bit. We knew that they were um, Northeast Kingdom, Essex and New Orleans uh, wasn't meeting our expectations in terms of vaccination rate. Uh, and I do realize that Barton is in New Orleans, but, but it's right on the edge of Essex County. So we were looking for a population center uh, that was easy to get to, uh, and uh, and and was we wanted to make it easy for people not to have to go through any uh, type of challenges in signing up to see if uh, if that would uh, give us a positive response. So it did, uh, and that's why we decided to move to this next phase of trying everything we possibly can get as creative as possible in order to get more shots and arms. So uh, that was just an experiment. Uh, that we decided to uh, to try out, and it was successful, and we're going to replicate that um, throughout the state. Thank you. Howard, BPR, excuse me, uh, Eric, Times Argus, and then we'll go to you, Howard. Yes, this is a likely a question for Dr. Levine. We heard from a reader in Rutland who noticed the cases in Rutland County aren't falling quite as quickly as they are in much of the rest of the state. Seems like the county is getting vaccinated. They're at 60, 61% vaccines. So the reader wants to know what is going on in Rutland that they haven't experienced a similar significant favorable decline. Sure. Um, I'm looking at Commissioner Pichek though, because I do not believe they're experiencing an increase. An increase this week, but so, it's just this one week. So they had one week with a slight increase all the previous weeks have been going down because literally every county in the state has been going down with the exception of Essex, which was just a few cases and it can, it, it's a smaller county so it's more susceptible to those numbers. But um, we have not documented new uh, outbreaks or patterns of transmission in Rutland. So I can't explain why in one week they had a change. I can't believe that will be a trend, but we'll have to watch that. But I do think um, they should not be alarmed and should continue their robust vaccination effort because uh, it's obviously been doing a lot of good. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to add a comment to the walk-in issue as well. There's what I would call a scheduled walk-in, which is you kind of know the walk-in is available that day and you make a plan to go to it. There's also a phenomenon of an unscheduled walk-in. And Secretary Smith referred to the potential, if it would happen, to be walking down Church Street. And actually there's 
a tent set up and there's an opportunity to get vaccine with some knowledgeable people from the healthcare professions there to talk with you. And it might be that moment in time when you say, gee, I haven't gotten my vaccine, maybe I ought to do that. Um, and we'd be meeting you uh, where you are, so to speak, which is really important. I already know from some of the pharmacies that even though they may not be advertising walk-in, they do have people who do shop in their pharmacy and ask the question, and if there's an opportunity that can be vaccinated, uh, so that would be what I would call an unscheduled opportunity for a walk-in too. So keep in mind that there's a lot of ways for people to get vaccine when it works for them and when they happen to be ready, both in their mindset and where they happen to be. Howard, VPR. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think this is for Secretary Smith. We got a uh, note from a listener, and he was wondering uh, when volunteers will be allowed into correctional facilities. He said a lot of volunteers take part in recovery programs, and he was wondering um, if that's going to be something that's going to be used up soon. Yeah, we're looking at that right now, Howard. Um, volunteers and visitation, by the way, um, we're looking at in corrections right now. One of the things that you, as um, I don't have the, the statistics, the exact statistics right in front of me, but we've had, out of our population, we've had about 800 that have been at least uh, one dose of vaccination and 400 and some odd that have refused. We want to get. We want to circle back on those refusals and see if we can get the uh, population um, more vaccinated in the inmate population as well. So we're looking at, um, you know, trying to raise the vaccination level within the correctional facility um, more, and then talking about volunteers and uh, visitation. Uh, once we feel comfortable with the vaccination or working through who, who's been vaccinated and who hasn't in order to reestablish the volunteer and, um, and uh, the visitation policy. We just want to be safe on this one. Those numbers you just gave me, that was for inmates or is that staff as well? And yeah. is staffing uh, an issue as well? Staff is about 80% vaccinated. Um, in terms of inmates, the, the numbers I gave you were inmates, um, uh, okay. th those that are, and I can get you, Howard, the exact number, but roughly it's out of the 1,200 that are incarcerated, um, we have about an 800-400 split. 800 have taken the vaccine, 400 uh, have refused. So do you think and hope this is weeks away or is this probably maybe more month or months away? I, I would say probably by the time we get everybody vaccinated, which will be at the end of May uh, with their second shot, I would say it's probably about a month away. Okay. Um, and thank you very much. Another question, I'm wondering um, if you're looking, the last person asked the question about the different parts of the state that um, the vac vaccination rates are higher and lower. Um, there have been national reports about red state, blue state, different vaccination rates. I'm wondering if someone can speak about what we do know about the parts of the state um, that are not getting vaccinated. What are you hearing? What have we learned, um, if anything? Demographically speaking, I think demographically speaking, we're talking about Essex County um, as as where we've been focused. And demographically, I mean, it's a very rural um, county, as the governor said. There's about six thousand people in that county, very spread out. Um, so what we are doing now is, and by the way, they have a border with New Hampshire up there as well. So there's opportunities. You know, I talked about Lancaster um, in terms of New Hampshire at the fair. We, we have an agreement in Colebrook with the medical center there. Um, so we're trying to get those numbers up, but I, you know, I haven't attributed it to red-blue. I've attributed it so far to rural and uh, trying to make sure that we do this sort of barnstorming idea 
for the second time. The first time we had great success with the barnstorming. The, the second time, we we're hoping to have the same sort of success um, through, uh, through this barnstorming method. Um, anybody else want to discuss? Um, is that okay, Howard? Yeah, that sounds great. Thank you so much. Thanks. Avery Powell, WCAX. We've seen a few vaccination clinics specifically for the homeless population. Are there any plans to do more of those? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, um, Secretary Smith. Yes, we uh, we are targeting over the next two weeks. We'll be um, make, uh, really making a concerted effort. Um, two to three weeks, making a concerted effort to uh, vaccinate the homeless population. Mostly with Johnson and Johnson, we're looking at Johnson and Johnson because it's one shot and done uh, as we move forward. But you'll see us moving forward over the next several weeks on uh, vaccinating the homeless. Is there any way to measure how the percentage of how many of them have been vaccinated so far? I will. You know, of course, we have the people that are in the um, general assistance program, the hotel motel program. I'll take a look and see if I can find that, Avery, and see if there's any information on that and see if we can, okay. if we've tracked that. Great, thank you. Michael, Vermont Digger. Me? We can. Can you hear me? We can. Okay, thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask about the school guidance uh, from the health department. Uh, back in the fall, uh, we kind of heard this referred to as the running nose rule uh, that children be uh, at school or child care uh, for any cold symptoms, uh, including. Now, as we're talking about uh, return to school full time, uh, getting parents back, of course. Uh, I wondered if there was uh, any plan to revisit that guidance. I think you're, uh, I think we get the flavor. Uh, you're cutting in and out. Uh, do you want Secretary French first and then Dr. Levine? Secretary French, anything from you and then we'll turn it over to Dr. Levine. Yeah, thanks. I think I caught most of that. Um, yeah, I think, you know, I would just say that um, there's, there's subtlety, obviously, to the question, and um, I would just point to the track record schools have had. I mean, it's almost been a year now our schools have been open and uh, having to navigate these issues and having gotten through, uh, you know, the winter months and cold and flu season and so forth. I think I think they've worked out uh, that subtlety in cooperation with the health department. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm optimistic now that uh, case counts are coming down. Schools are doing their best to expand in person. and. Um, yeah, so I, I think they figured that out, and uh, I'm optimistic in the next couple of weeks that we'll see more in-person learning. You know, I'm trying to discern if there was another subtlety to the question regarding the actual symptoms which come to the forefront this time of year when a lot of students and adults have allergy symptoms. Um, and I believe we've navigated that pretty well. Uh, and we've had great input from the pediatrics community at large, um, who obviously are helping with case by case. So I, I think I'd go along with Secretary French that you've done well in that regard. Was there anything we didn't answer in your questions? Because it, it didn't come through very clearly. I'm sorry about the sound problem there. I, I guess what I was getting at was, you know, we've, we've heard from parents throughout this season uh, that that can really cut into their ability to really consider school or child care as, as really full time. Uh, and especially, you know, when it comes to the idea of folks getting back into the workforce and particularly folks that, uh, you know, it seems have, have really been uh, at a disadvantage so far, parents, uh, particularly moms. Uh, you know, is that under consideration at all? Any kind of, uh, of change to that guidance with, with those kind of factors in mind? Yeah, so just to introduce that topic, uh, there's been a lot of news lately about the differential impact of the pandemic on women versus men. A lot of it looks at just what you mentioned, uh, women's ab ability to maintain their position or enter or re-enter the workforce. 
uh, concerns about child care. Most of that is relating to schools that actually are in non-in-person or hybrid learning um, and the uncertainties about will there be in-person learning, et cetera. So that hasn't been our problem as much. I think you're referring to more the need for absenteeism on the part of the student because of symptoms that may not be COVID, but that could be COVID. And uh, could we uh, be more flexible on those? So they did not change substantially in the newest iteration of the guidance. Um, although there is a fair amount of um, healthcare system decision making that's incorporated into that, and I'm sure that that will be revisited for the fall, but uh, not at this point in time. Thank you. Guy Page, Chronicle of the Vermont State House. Last week, police arrested an Enosburg man for dealing heroin and meth in what the state police said was, uh, quote, the conclusion of a Vermont Drug Task Force investigation that began in July 2020. Uh, this man was out on probation when he allegedly committed the crime, and after his arrest, he was cited to appear in court, he was not returned to prison. And I'm wondering, uh, and my readers are wondering, is this a police tactic to perhaps lead them to other dealers? Is it just an example of the trend towards decarceration, or is it something else? And in any event, what would you say to Vermonters who don't think that heroin dealers on probation should just be released with a date to appear in court? I may refer to uh, Commissioner Shirley on this one. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, over the years, the options available uh, to the front end of the criminal justice system, in particular law enforcement, have become more limited in terms of the rules of arrest and when folks can go uh, to jail and, and otherwise. Um, I'm not sure whether this particular instance is an example of that, but I make that observation more generally. Um, we don't discuss investigative tactics, so if there is another um, another motivation behind that. It's not something uh, we would be openly um, discussing. Uh, in terms of the general uh, approach to folks who are dealing heroin, methamphetamine, uh, and drugs that are clearly destructive uh, in our communities is something that uh, the Drug Task Force takes incredibly seriously, and uh, I trust that uh, whatever tactics they're employing are uh, the ones that have been best deemed to uh, bring a case to successful conclusion. So when you said at the beginning options are, have become more limited, what do you mean by that? So this could take a while to unpack, but generally um, the ability to incarcerate someone pre-trial has been limited substantially by uh, new statutes that have been passed. Uh, again, whether this is specific to that, I'd have to look into the specific circumstances, but I think you will see generally uh, more and more people released on citations uh, rather than being uh, lodged initially and uh, a much larger cross-section of people that are not detained pre-trial regardless of their um, offense or alleged offense. Mm -hmm. you concerned about that as far as just general public safety? I am concerned that uh, we have lost our general sense of balance in the criminal justice system. I think uh, some of the efforts that have been put in place in recent years have improved operations, but at the same time, I, I think there are others that are uh, questionable public policy initiatives. Hmm. Thank you. I think as well, you know, detaining someone uh, at this point in time throughout the last year has been problematic uh, because the court system has been impacted by the pandemic. So I think uh, this is uh, further, um, it's been problematic in, in a lot of different ways and hopefully in the future we'll have more uh, timely court appearances when the judicial branches opens up further. Okay, thank you. Tom Davis, Compass, Vermont. Hi, thanks, Jason. Uh, I have no questions today. Thank you all. Thank you, Tom. 
And lastly, Ed Barber, Newport Daily Express. I have uh, two questions. One of them I want to follow up with the issue of uh, Department of Corrections. Since the uh, pandemic uh, went into effect, I seem to uh, believe that there was a um, semi-lockdown. The uh, inmates had to stay in their cells. They couldn't congregate uh, for to the cafeteria for dinner, and were and they shut down the uh, Vermont Corrections Industries. Um, with a number of people who have been vaccinated now, are you going to be um, loosening up some of those restrictions, um, especially in light of the fact that this also creates uh, mental health issues or it's, uh, exacerbates uh, current issues? Yeah, I'm going to let uh, Secretary Smith answer that, but, uh, but I would add that as you look at the number of uh, offender, uh, the offender population being vaccinated, um, it isn't consistent uh, throughout the system. So making uh, you know a broad statement about opening up uh, wouldn't work uh, because there's some some uh, of those facilities uh, that have a very low uptake, and uh, and so you wouldn't want to open anything up in those areas. But Secretary Smith. Ed, thanks for the question. As you, um, as you, COVID protocol requires that if we have anything um, where we have cases within within the facility, um, that we go to a lockdown status. We don't have any but any facility right now in a full lockdown status. We have them in a modified lockdown status, which is the standard sort of during COVID nineteen. I think um, we are discussing how. We're going to be opening up the various, as I mentioned before, how we're going to be opening up the various um, uh, activities within uh, the Department of Corrections. That can be uh, anything from visitation to, um, as you mentioned, the, the industries aspect of it up in the Newport facility in terms of how we move forward. We also are looking at the, the pandemic uh, really did um, uh, shift the skill levels that you're going to need for different things and looking at how we can meet the needs of, um, of those inmates in terms of having technical skills uh, when they get out of the facility. All of that is being reviewed right now as I talk to Howard about we're looking at you know visitation, we're looking at volunteers, we're looking at um, how we sort of bring the, in, in, the industrial industries um, aspect of corrections back up to speed, and including work crews for the summer. Uh, how do we bring that all up to speed? We do have to get better vaccination rates uh, in uh, the Department of Corrections among inmates. Uh, and we, 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 we are putting in place a, a revisiting program, I guess, is to those that have declined vaccination, trying to find out why and trying to answer any of their questions that they, they may have along the way. So um, I would say, Ed, stay tuned. Thanks. Any other questions? I did tell the former uh, operator of the UPS store in Newport that was um, defying the, the mask mandate. His attorney is uh, back in court uh, with a unique argument to suggest that if the state of emergency should have been stopped when the legislature reconvened, that was one of several arguments that was being made. That is being heard before a judge. Uh, do you have any comment on what the legality of continuing the state of emergency when the legislature is in session? I would only add that uh, we're on solid ground. We we feel that we have um, the obligation and the right uh, to impose these restrictions during this time of emergency. So we, we feel we're on solid ground there. Very good. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Have a good day. You too. In closing, I just want to uh, note that it's Teacher Appreciation Week. 
and National Teacher Day. So I want to send my thanks to the teachers out there uh, who have been working under very difficult circumstances over the last 14 months to do what's best for our kids. So with that, uh, don't forget to sign up for your vaccine. Consider the Mother's Day gift, and we'll see you again on Friday. Thank you.